Have you ever wished you could travel all over the world and meet masterful people in the field of education? People you may not have known and the stories you've never heard. Cup of Capacity is just that. I wanted to introduce you to masterful people in education. Some are people I have known and some I have heard about. They were chosen for their unique impact on education and to share the insights they've learned along the way. In a digital setting, each monthly episode features an in-depth conversation with a masterful leader as they explore their journey and answer a series of questions. Grab a refreshment and let's enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Cup of Capacity. This is being filmed. We're still actively in the midst of quarantining and um, who would have thought it would gone on this long but we're super excited to have this conversation today. Today I have with me Judy Wallace. Judy Wallace is a force of nature. She is my friend and a mentor. She not only changed the course of literacy for a large urban school district, she did it twice and I don't know anyone else in my lifetime who can claim that. She is an author, a professor, a staff developer, and the kind of person you call when you can't solve a problem that addresses instruction. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today, Judy. Well, it's an honor to be here for sure. Um, I'm humbled that you asked me and uh, I'm eager to, uh, to respond to some of the things that have made uh, my life one of joyful opportunities uh, in education. Uh, for now, almost 50 years. So it's been a, a, a long journey. Uh, to, we have to go back really to uh, the very beginning. Um, I grew up in San Antonio and uh, we had a screened porch on our 1940s home, uh, which, which lots of homes had at that time. But uh, as an only child, I I had time to spend alone, although I had uh, the neighborhoods in those days were uh, a family of sorts uh, where everybody watched everybody's kids. But in that screen porch, I would uh, put uh, different things for, for my dolls and animals to sit on and I would teach them. I suppose I had a little bit of experience, uh, perhaps because I had gone to nursery school, uh, which is what it was called in those days. But I would um, become the teacher and uh, spend a great deal of time uh, in, that, uh, in that role of teaching I got to first grade, and uh, that was the first grade, unless you went to uh, a kindergarten that was outside of the school system. Uh, and I went to a, a school called Laura Steele, named for um, a very famous educator. And so I think I talked a lot. And uh, the best way, I also was an early reader, um, I had learned to read uh, perched on my father's lap on Sundays looking at the funny papers and he would read them to me and I remember distinctly one Sunday when all of a sudden I could read them myself. And so I suppose because I was chatty, uh, the teacher must have just learned about, this is 1950-ish, um, and the teacher must have just learned about um, peer tutoring. And so she would send me out on the steps of the school, which was on a busy street, never, never would we do that today, with one of the kids who she felt might benefit from uh, some extra reading help. And I remember sitting on those uh, steps and uh, saying to the, to the person that I was helping, read with expression. And uh, that was the only uh, strategy I knew at the time, of course, to teach reading. I, uh, I of course, uh, along the way had three children and along the way even farther, I had seven grandchildren. And uh, those uh, experiences have certainly influenced me. I had the opportunity to teach in a two and a half to five year old broadly graded program where uh, six teachers, one floater, so seven of us, 
uh, were um, assigned different centers. And it was um, 36 children, two and a half to five years of age. And each of us um, had a center that we were responsible for that week. So it was based very much on some of the Montessori traditions, uh, but also uh, the person that conceptualized the school was a pediatric nurse. So she had read Piaget and Erickson and all the early childhood developers. And I spend time on that because there were some important things I learned um, in those uh, eight years that I was there. Uh, one of the things I learned is that um, one person is never enough, that children need opportunities to interact with lots of adults across a school day. And uh, the, the people that I worked with were um, just an, uh, an amazing group. Uh, and so I cherish that experience because one, I learned so much about uh, teaching because with young children, you must plan what you do and think about what you do and also be ready to respond in the moment. And so those years were um, really some of the most valuable in teaching me how important collegiality is, how important uh, working with others is, and how important a community of children can be, because indeed that was what we saw develop. I went to A-Leaf um, and next, and uh, those years were amazing years. I spent 18 years there in A-Leaf. 12 of them I spent as a language arts director, two as a coach, and five years as a, uh, as a teacher. And uh, those years were um, unbelievably um, impactful on my, my career, on, on who I am today. Uh, A-Leaf at the time was filled with people who were thoughtful, intelligent, um, smart, willing to take risks uh, and deeply, deeply dedicated to both children and adults. So Elif was filled with professional opportunities for teachers. Um, teachers were expected to be, as Don Graves once said, the chief learner in the classroom. And so in fact, that was what happened. Uh, I distinctly recall, and this would influence the rest of my life. Um, I would often, uh, I, I of course joined the uh, International Reading Association and uh, NCTE, and every month when my journals would come, I would read eagerly what the most current research uh, ha was saying. And I would long for someone to talk to <laughs> about that research. And it, in my particular school, most of the conversation was uh, really about the immediate planning that we were doing. There, there was um, less of an emphasis on what was happening outside. And so um, I, I remember thinking and I can still see myself standing in the classroom. I remember thinking if I ever had the chance to create a place in space where people can come together and learn from each other and talk about what is happening outside uh, our school and our district, that I would make that a priority. Little did I know at that time, there was no way of knowing that I might have that chance. It did send me back to graduate school. So I did go back to graduate school and earn a, a master's degree in reading. And that satisfied for a time some of my longing uh, to talk to other people about what was important. Um, 
when uh, I, uh, I, there was a wonderful uh, mentor for me, Karen Cudiper was at the time the language arts uh, coordinator for the school district and she worked across the grades. And in 1988, they decided that they would um, have an elementary person too. <clears throat> I applied for the job. I'd been a coach for a couple of years at that point and had the opportunity to work with some really um, amazing other coaches. They were called specialists in A-LEAF, uh, which was way ahead of its time because those specialists were um, conceptualized and introduced by Betty Best in 1981. So A-LEAF was, uh, I think, way ahead of the curve knowing that teachers needed uh, a resource right in their buildings. So um, miraculously, I got the job. I, I still feel so incredibly fortunate. And Karen, I think, played an important role in a couple of ways. One, she was deeply committed uh, to her own learning. And secondly, she was deeply committed to the professional world outside the school district. So she, um, she had uh, affiliations, of course, with the uh, local and the state and the national organizations that were so influential in literacy. Uh, I followed in her path, and, uh, and I think that that was important. I, I later um, became president of the Greater Houston Area Reading Council, where we had amazing breakfasts with 1,600 people sometimes with balloons and uh, book authors, and it was uh, a celebration and uh, certainly of literacy and uh, impacted so many people in making sure that kids not only learned how to read, but also uh, teachers were committed to connecting them with amazing literature. So that was, um, that was such an opportunity. Uh, uh, the coaches or specialists as they were called uh, were um, so fortunate because the budget in A-LEAF allowed me to bring in amazing uh, educators of the day. Uh, so Don Graves, I remember, came two years in a row and we piled into an auditorium uh, to hear Don Graves and we had little intermittent sessions where we uh, broke out and talked about our favorite books and reading and writing. Uh, Steph Harvey, Ellen Kane, uh, Reggie Routman, all of those folks were right there with us and they became not only our mentors, but our friends. And so uh, that became another wonderful uh, opportunity to connect all the people that I worked with, with the greatest uh, folks of the day. Um, I also had an opportunity, and I would be remiss not to mention a colleague. Uh, his name was Drake Sharp, and he uh, was uh, a, a specialist with me. Uh, we'd been co-specialists, and then uh, he worked with me in another capacity as the Title I teacher. And then um, we had an opportunity for him to come to the administration building and work as an early childhood a, a coordinator and then he as I left became a principal and was a beloved principal and uh, and so I wanted to interject if I could for just a minute I think for all of us everyone who's watching as well as you many times we we're giving our heart and we're doing you know what we feel is the best thing but we don't always we'll see some impact some effects but we never know and I just want to share with the audience that when I was a baby starting out, I started in a -Leaf and, you know, so we all learn from me. I was so focused on just learning how to be a teacher that I had no awareness of anybody in the district office or anything that was going on. 
But what I can say from that time, when I look back uh, in that system, there was such a clear vision of what good instruction looked like. And so I am an example of the echo effects of your work and Drake's work, because when I stepped on my campus, I was a pre-K teacher. Uh, it was very clear and I was part of a strong team in a very, very um, in an area where kids were really faced with a lot of challenges, economic, uh, social, uh, and most definitely literacy. And so, um, you know, this Zoomcast is born out of uh, my doctoral work, where it will be no surprise to you, uh, as I studied an area district, I found that capacity building was the most important thing. Mm. And uh, I really wanted educators, whether they're teachers or principals or district people, to be able to hear from all these experts. And that's really the work that you've done throughout your life. And so when I stepped onto that campus, I had a phenomenal team who was very clear about what good instruction looked like. We were very supportive. And I had a specialist who came in and modeled in my classroom, who um, you know would engage in professional conversations. And I think that laid such a great foundation. And so I just want to add to your story that uh, I am an echo effect of that. And I didn't, I didn't even know you at that time. I had never met you. And it would be not until we were both in another district that we engaged with each other. But I can say I felt the effects of that work. Well, I think that that illustrates so, uh, so importantly, one of the things that um, takes me back to that relationship with Drake, uh, the beliefs were uh, were clearly in place in a uh, Betty uh, Best had engaged us in writing in vision statements way back um, in the, I, I guess it was really even before 1990, but we would create these envision statements about what we envisioned a good language arts classroom. Uh, look like and what good language arts instruction look like and uh, and and so uh, she did that for all you know she in, in engaged all the content areas in doing that very thing so those beliefs were very clear and and the practices that then came out of those beliefs were also very clear and were shared across the district so uh, there was a kind of a coherent approach to teaching and learning uh, that I think everyone benefited from. There weren't mixed messages. Uh, the other thing I'd say about that time is, and, and certainly this is some advice, is find a person that you can work with where you don't have to debate what's right or wrong about teaching and learning, but you can just uh, team up and do the work. And so I think uh, for me, that was a kind of magical time in terms of a person that I trusted, that he, he was my friend, he was uh, trustworthy, and he was brilliant. So the work that we could do together was certainly more than I could have done alone. Dwight perhaps could have done it alone, but without him, we would never have had the kinds of robust instruction that I believe we did have. There were certainly challenges uh, as, uh, as the reading wars occurred. Uh, there were some challenges in A-Leaf, and I have to share that uh, during those challenging times, I was working on my doctorate, and uh, Dick Abrahamson was my advisor and, and chair, and he said to me, do you know where your line is? And so I often tell people today that the most important question in my professional life was that one as we were walking across the street, leaving the Harris County Department of Education. And he turned to me and said, do you know where your line is? And I went home and thought about that a lot. And I realized that my line was always, if it was good for teachers and kids, 
then I would be willing to fight for it. If it was not good for teachers and kids, then I would, um, I would um, push against it. And so that was uh, an incredibly uh, important idea. Uh, working on my doctorate was lots of fun. Uh, Colleen Beers and Terry Lassane, who are both amazing uh, educators, uh, sat right on the same row in some of the classes with me, and um, and I reconnected with an old neighbor. And so uh, I think um, you probably discovered that same thing that um, that collegiality and is is such an important facet. I went to Spring Branch in 1999, not because I was looking for a job, uh, but because they happened to call and I went and chatted with them. And the next thing I knew, I said, yes. Uh, and part of the um, enticement was working pre-K through 12 because I'd realized that it, you can create change uh, pre-K through five or six, uh, but if nothing happens that, that is uh, coherent with what's been happening in those early grades, then kids uh, find school uh, somewhat disjointed. And so that was a great opportunity. And I worked hard <laughs> for the nine years I was in Spring Branch. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was housed in a school because of some situations that occurred with uh, uh, Westchester High School and having to be a, a, a spillover from Stratford, I moved into a school and sometimes people would uh, drive by late at night and I, my office is in the library and people would wave or honk because I was often still in my office. What what I learned in Spring Branch, I think, was important. I learned that um, that people matter, uh, and people matter in two ways. People matter when they uh, support what you're doing and and offer you the kinds of um, resources, uh, and that means money, um, as well as when people don't really fully understand. But the work that we did was because of the strong people like you and others who um, who all put your shoulders to the to the wheel and and pushed hard. I um, I always love that Marge Piercy poem about uh, the people I love or the people who work hard. And certainly um, in nine years, uh, a couple of things happened that I think were um, absolutely uh, a result of that kind of work. And uh, one, one of the things that happened is that we closed the gap. Um, so often you can close the gap where you go this way <laughs> instead of closing the gap where everybody moves up. And so, one of my uh, greatest um, joys was seeing that we closed a gap to five points. So our, our, our students who uh, sometimes didn't have everything going for them were at 93% and our kids who had, uh, were living in a kind of privileged situation were at 98. And so, uh, what I realized is that good teaching matters. And, um, and so that was the way we spent our time. And so we had all those people that I mentioned before uh, were in Spring Branch, uh, along with Chris Devani and Kelly Gallagher and uh, Tom Newkirk and, and uh, Tom Romano and uh, just a host of people that, um, uh, that and Matt Glover, I should mention him because he was one of the newer ones at that time. But we were so fortunate that A Leaf and Spring Branch provided the resources because guess what? 
you can say that kids are important, but in my world, sitting in that position for 21 years, teachers were the most important change agent. They were the unit of change. It mattered what they thought, it mattered what they knew. And so I knew if I took care of teachers, teachers would take care of kids. And so just a, a great opportunity. I retired and I put quotes around that. Um, and I've been retired 12 years, which is hard to believe. But in the 12 years, uh, I did some, uh, I've done some things that were, um, were things that brought me great uh, joy and certainly satisfaction. I had the opportunity to work with closely with Regie Routman. We'd been friends a long time. I'd written the blue pages in two of her books. Um, but I got to work um, on an everyday basis with Regie, although I was separated by miles. Uh, we emailed back and forth and talked and uh, I had um, a great opportunity to work with her and also um, work with uh, Heinemann. I, I got to work a lot in uh, classrooms. I was invited and I realized that the greatest joy there is, is um, being in the sacred space of a classroom because it is a sacred space. Um, anytime you are uh, not only being able to learn with children, but learn from children, it's a sacred experience. I got to write a couple of books with Steph Harvey and, and Goodness, and that was, um, that was a, a privilege, I have to say. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate to work in long-term projects in Murfreesboro and Arizona, um, Hobbs, New Mexico, most recently. And so those projects have made me realize uh, a couple of things, the importance of strong principles, uh, the importance of shared beliefs and shared practices, uh, the importance of knowing where your line is and what you will or won't do. And uh, so uh, right now, uh, we're in year five of the Hobbs New Mexico project. And, and of course the pandemic has stalled uh, that project um, as, uh, as we'd, not as we'd hoped. But I guess I come to this point now, three quarters of the century old. <laughs> uh, I guess I come to this point with enormous gratitude for the opportunities uh, that I've been offered uh, with, in some ways, a, a, a kind of surprise that, um, that I got those opportunities, you know, um, they feel, sometimes it felt surreal to, to be able to, uh, to be in the places I was with the people I was. Um, I also am grateful that so many of the colleagues that I shared time with in both districts, and some I shared, as you, in both districts, which was a real uh, privilege, um, those folks have become not only my colleagues, but lifelong friends. And so uh, I come to this point, uh, looking back uh, with, um, enormous gratitude. I wrote a piece a few years ago in, that appeared in Educational Week and it was called Teachers Don't Forget the Joy. And so um, if there are, are any administrative folks who listen to this, I think one of the things that I feel the most strongly about is that we should never ever lose the heart of a teacher. That regardless of what our title is, uh, whether it's principal or superintendent or uh, coordinator or director, we have to keep in, in our, uh, our minds the fact that we're first and foremost a teacher because in every role, uh, that's the, the sacred call. So I want to add to that. I think that, um, 
and I, I and I do it not for my own self, but really to illustrate to the people who are listening. Um, you know, you've had this phenomenal life experience, but then the impact on your work on other people. And as I mentioned before, uh, I had come into A Leaf as a brand new teacher, and it. You know, we're mentioning school districts and we've mentioned in my previous interviews, we've mentioned uh, school districts and sometimes it can be uh, somebody can feel a certain kind of way when they hear their school district. But, you know, every district has its golden moments and its challenges and there are ups and downs in every school district. So the name of the district really does not matter. You could be saying District A or District B, but uh, I left Ailey uh, and came to uh, Spring Branch and I will never forget um, meeting with my team and we were building a brand new building. So we were displaced and um, the experience was wonderful. And that time I felt like it was really wonderful because I kind of was given the freedom to do what I wanted to do. So I had to kind of stop. Whereas before in the previous district, you know, it was a very clear vision uh, and I was learning, learning, learning for three years. And then in my fourth year in a new district, I got to kind of stop and say, oh, okay, if I have total freedom, then do I want to continue doing these practices? Do I want to try different things? But then very quickly, it didn't feel very satisfying. I was like hungry for that feeding kind of feeling. There was no specialist. Um, and I believe that's probably about the time you were coming into the district as well. And so it didn't take very long. I'm trying to think back on my career. It didn't take very long before I was pursuing becoming a, a coach myself. And so it was during that time that I really got to know you better, really uh, got to spend time with you. You had a monthly meeting with us. And I have to say, Judy, you set a very high bar. I have worked at the district level as a literacy director, um, and I've done it for secondary and elementary, but not both at the same time. And I remember going to your meetings. You always had several articles for us to read you almost always had some expert, and these are not inexpensive, now I know, not inexpensive uh, experts, so that means that you had to get district approval, you had to have a budget for that, and I know that you had to fight for that because I know, having been in those shoes, um, there are many people who just wanna buy a program and uh, not rely on the capacity of the teacher. They just want to, they. And I think it's not, it's not a put down on a person. I think it's the function of the brain. When yeah. we're under stress, we think, okay, if I just organize better, right? Like during this COVID quarantine, we're all like, that's why the home edit is so popular right now. Like people just believe if I could organize better, it's going to guarantee safety and security. And I think when, and it doesn't matter what role you're in, superintendent, director, whatever, you think, okay, if I just got a script, if I just got a formula, I don't have to rely on the unknown, which is the capacity of the teacher. But we know, you and I know from research over and over and over again, you said the teacher is the most important unit. That is proven by research over and over. And we also know that although it is messy, much like parenthood, you know, being a parent is messy. There is no perfect way to raise a child. It's the same way with the classroom and the teacher. You, it feels super messy to just invest and build the capacity of the teacher, but in reality, it's going to work better than a formula or something you put kids in front of. And, but it's so hard to buy in because it feels so messy. Um, and so you did that so effectively. And I really, and not just you, I can think of other leaders uh, that I have worked for where they make it look easy. But now I know that was a lot of tough meetings, a lot of advocating, a lot of arguing behind the scenes to get the funding for those experts, for you to spend the hours pulling articles that aligned with whatever you were focused on that month. You always built in time for us to talk. There were always things that we would do in the classroom. Uh, and so I really do feel like, you know, how you described your, your desire and your experience in growing in your personal knowledge and your beliefs, uh, that was my period of growth. And um, it very rarely happens. Uh, and then when uh, I had the opportunity to be a principal, I've been a principal three times, I've always had you come in and work with our teachers and our staff. Uh, and it, it's always growing and learning for me. I wouldn't miss out on any of those sessions for the world. Uh, and also you modeling in the classroom so they see that you're not just pontificating, saying what you believe, but that you actually can show what that looks like in a classroom. So um, I just really wanted to add on my thoughts to that. Well, thank you. and I. Uh, I I have to say that I'm so 
and, and proud sounds like a, I don't know, it doesn't sound like the right word, but it's the only word I can think of right now, but uh, maybe gratified. Um, it is, it is so uh, wonderful to see so many, and, and I mean many like you, who've gone on to be leaders in uh, other districts and other states. Uh, and, and so just having worked with uh, people who went on to make uh, a difference, and I think that that also makes me even more dedicated to the fact that our job is not just to make ourselves look great, but our job is to make others look great and to find uh, the capacity and build capacity in other people. So uh, that I hope has been um, a thread that's been woven throughout all of the work is that, uh, is that we, we invest in other people. Our legacy is in people. It's not in a program or a district. It's in the people that we've um, had the opportunity to come in contact with and they uh, to influence us. Uh, I also want to just leave you with one metaphor as we um, sort of close out this part of our conversation. I realized uh, along the way that the meetings that you spoke about, both in uh, those were similar in A Leaf as they were in Spring Branch, they were really like campfire sessions. So I've, I've used the metaphor of building a campfire. And that's really um, a, a way to, to, to think about what happens around a campfire. Some people just chat around a campfire. And I think that that's an important thing to do. Sometimes there is someone who tells a story around a campfire and everyone listens to the story. Uh, sometimes someone shares an important uh, truth about life around a campfire. Sometimes you sing together and you just, uh, uh, and other times you simply sit and reflect and enjoy the warmth of, of just being together. And so I, I think that uh, what, what we build our campfires as leaders. So this idea of uh, a campfire is one that I think is important uh, because the work that you do is always strengthened by the relationships that you build. And I think uh, Michael Fullan uh, and cer certainly Andy Hargraves have written uh, a, a lot about how, how culture plays a role in uh, forwarding work. So this idea of building campfires where people can do all the things uh, that they do around the campfire, tell stories, uh, sing songs, uh, just enjoy the warmth, uh, just enjoy the uh, relationship. Uh, those are things that we have to attend to. Um, and without that as a an actual goal. I think that sometimes that's why our initiatives fail, is because we fail to pay attention to the human aspects of, uh, of learning and working together. I think that uh, you and I both are fans of Brene Brown's work, and uh, that makes me think of vulnerability. And I think that's built into that campfire time. Uh, For sure. You know, we can go on our own lifetime experience. And because this summer I just finished my doctoral research and work, um, you know, that that um, belief about coming together to build capacity, but also if everyone's protecting their ego and no one is willing to point out what questions they have, what things they don't have mastery over, uh, for fear of being ridiculed, you'll really never get very far. And so I really do think that that's a, a key component uh, to success for a classroom, a school, a district. Yeah. And I think, I, I'm so glad you mentioned Brene Brown's work because it, it certainly uh, unfolded after I was in uh, district positions. But I, as I look back, I really think that 
much of what we accomplished was because uh, people were were willing to be vulnerable and willing to take risks. And I, of course, um, love the quote that uh, that she borrowed the title from, The Daring Greatly, uh, because I think that people can stand on the outside, and certainly there are those that do, and they're quick to uh, celebrate and quick to criticize criticize. Uh, but when you're in the ring, uh, you do the work and sometimes it, it goes well and sometimes it doesn't, but at least um, at least you, you've uh, engaged in the work. And uh, that's why I love that Marge Piercy poem uh, so much, uh, because it celebrates, in fact, those people who are in the mud and muck and working uh, so hard to make things happen. Well, thank you. I want to wrap up today with asking you just a handful of questions. And uh, Judy and I talked earlier, uh, Judy wears hearing aids. And I have found that by wearing a mask during quarantine, I have learned that I also probably need to have my hearing checked. So uh, we're going to, uh, I'll try to really enunciate uh, the questions. But my first question is, what is your favorite book? Uh, well, you know, that is just almost impossible to answer. Uh, there are a couple books uh, that I think uh, are favorites. I can't just mention one because uh, we read for different purposes. And so uh, The Nightingale was a book that, uh, that really affected me recently. Um, and perhaps it was because we had made a, a long awaited trip to Paris. And so uh, being able to think about the, uh, the sacrifices and hardships uh, that were going on uh, really just as I was born. Um, and so that was the book that um, affected me greatly. Uh, I, I think I have to say The Giver, um, you know, uh, Thinking back to uh, the givers um, uh, uh, coming into our literary canon, uh, it was um, it's such a powerful book, and I think uh, even today it continues to register a warning to us about the kinds of societies that. Um, that are oppressive and this idea of dystopia versus um, striving for a more utopian. Um, and then I would have to say um, Tipping Point was an important book and Tipping Point was a book that we read as a group of literacy coaches in, in Spring Branch. And I think um, Tipping Point is a book that I would absolutely uh, suggest that any leader read uh, because there's such wisdom there. Okay. Um, when you're reading a really good book, what are you snacking on or drinking? What do you like to have with you? Well, uh, it depends on where I am, but probably cold coffee. I'm terrible about pouring a cup of coffee and engaging in my reading and writing and forgetting that the cup of coffee is there. Uh, and so um, uh, I would say cold coffee is probably, <laughs> uh, I don't generally snack when I'm reading, but, um, but uh, you know, lost in a book is something uh, that we all um, cherish when it happens. And we literally, uh, as Chris Devani said, we're not lost in a book. We don't understand it versus that euphoric feeling of being lost. So uh, a, a cup of cold coffee is often what's sitting beside me. Great. So if we're thinking about a new teacher or a new principal or even a new superintendent, it, when you're thinking about reading and you're thinking about writing, what would be the, like, the three things that you would want them to know? Oh gosh, uh, the first probably is that kids need to do it a lot, both of those things. Uh, so time, um, time, uh, volume, access, those are our key things. So I would say 
uh, we know the closer the books are to the kids, we know the closer um, all kinds of paper for writing is to the kids, the more they'll uh, be able to access it. Um, I think that um, to, to give, uh, make sure that we give kids opportunities to talk, um, I think that we've only just recently begun to realize and unpack the power of classroom conversations. In fact, it was a real privilege this summer to do a virtual PD on just that, nothing but just um, the, the kind of discourse in the classroom and how do we foster that. And then um, the professional lives of teachers. Um, I think that, and this I might get preachy about, administra administrators spend way too much time giving information at meetings that they could put in an email. And uh, we should cherish the time that we're all sitting in the same place at the same time. Uh, so if, if the, the health and uh, smartness of teachers is what matters most, then we have to spend lots of opportunities creating exemplary teachers. And uh, so I often think about those six T's uh, that Dick Ellington uh, and his colleagues uncovered in those exemplary teacher studies. Those for me um, create the blueprint uh, for um, great reading and writing classrooms. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to include the poems, the articles, and everything that we've mentioned today onto my blog so that people can access those easily. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, I, Judy, I, you know I adore you and I so appreciate you. And I thank you for this time that you've given us today. And um, thank you for everything that you've done. Well, I have to say thank you back to you because um, you've served in some amazing roles uh, and used all the experiences that you've had, um, not only those that we've shared, but others that you've had uh, to make the, the world better and the world of education better. So uh, I, I owe you a debt too because um, we all, uh, are in this work together and it it takes a village doesn't it it most certainly does thank you again i appreciate it hey thanks for listening to this interview i hope you found value in the conversation made a connection with your own life and had an aha moment or two 